Good day to everybody. I'd like us to uh, begin reading from Ezekiel chapter 10, and we're going to read from verse 4, and we'll read till the end of the chapter. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 4, to the end of the chapter. So it begins this way. It says, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubim's, uh, then he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubim uh, onto the fire that was between the cherubim and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubim the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. And as for their appearance, their four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. <clears throat> when they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked. They followed it. They turned not as they went. And their whole body, and their backs, and their hands, and their wings, and the wheels, were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that the four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And every one had four faces. The first was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. And the cherubim were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kibar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood, and when they were lifted up, uh, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar, and I knew that they were the cherubim. Every one had four faces apiece, every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Kibar, their appearances and themselves they went everyone straight forward. And again, God will indeed bless uh, the reading of this uh, precious portion of scripture to our hearts. So as we look at chapter 10, just to remind us what this chapter is really about, if you remember that Ezekiel was taken in vision to Jerusalem, he's in captivity uh, by the banks of the Kibar, but God, as it were, takes him from his house in spirit to Jerusalem to see the reasons why the glory of God was departing from uh, Jerusalem and why judgment was coming. And in this particular chapter, we have two things going on. We have a, a depiction of that departure of the glory of God, what we, we called it last time, I think we said it was kind of an Ichabod chapter, the glory departing. But also, as well as this departure of the glory of God, we have, subsequent to the departure of the glory of God, we have the depiction of the destruction of the city of God. And that's the taking of the coal of fire. And of course, that is to be flung down, as it were, uh, in judgment. And I thought an appropriate 
uh, title uh, really for this little ch section would be fire from above because that's exactly what it is god is sending fire from above symbolically remember this is symbolically of what's going to happen in the babylonian invasion and symbolically the babylonians are going to come and they're going to burn the city with fire and so uh, the, but but he wants them to know and this is why ezekiel is seeing this vision he wants them to know that the chaldeans are actually god's instrument that God is the one who is initiating this, that it's the divine throne that is orchestrating these world events. And I think that's really important for us to, to, to lay hold of that. What is also very fascinating, uh, at least to my mind, is that what Ezekiel saw uh, it, when he was taken in spirit, he saw the glory of God. And the sad thing is that in these visions, he's described a lot of different groups of people. Uh, we saw it in Ezekiel chapter 8. And they're all busy in the house of God, uh, involved in idolatry. And what's remarkable is that it seems that the only person in the whole of the visions that saw the glory of God was Ezekiel. The other people did not see it. The sad thing uh, was that Ezekiel was evidently the only person who saw the glory of God, the rest had eyes for images, pictures, and the lesser glory of the sun. They were looking at the creeping things on the wall. They were looking at the, the, the sun, uh, but they were missing the glory of God. And I thought, what a, what a challenge, really, uh, that it's possible for people to see all the religious things and you see it today in the world. People get so caught up with going into cathedrals, and they they like the you know the smells, they like the uh, the atmosphere, the vibe. They like all the tra the tra the trappings, if you like. But what they miss is the the gathering center of Christianity, Christ, the Lord of Glory. They miss him completely, and they see all the other stuff. And that's exactly what's going on here. But sadly, it's God's people in the Old Testament who are witnessing all of this idolatry and they're missing the glory. Only Ezekiel seems to see it. Now, we talked about the fact that he sees the same vision of this chariot throne that he saw in chapter 1. And we, we mentioned that without going through every detail, because we already did that in chapter one, you could always go back and re-listen to chapter one. What we wanted to do was point out the differences. Uh, there's some additions and there's some omissions. And so we wanted to just consider the additions and the omissions as we considered the chariot throne. So the first thing that we, we want to notice in verse five is it says, the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And so one thing is that the senses are certainly, uh, Ezekiel's senses are certainly being affected by this. Not only what he sees, but what he hears. And he hears this sound of the cherubim's wings. And obviously, it must be quite uh, quite noisy uh, because he talks about it being uh, described as uh, like the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. Well, when God speaks and we, we, we hear him speak in different times, it, it, it talks about uh, him being like thunder. It talks about uh, in Revelation 115, like the... Uh, in fact, let me read it. Revelation one fifteen. He he says there, it's like and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. <laughs> and so the, the idea is that it, it's it's pretty significant. You know, if you if you go to Niagara, you can you can hear the 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 kind of roar of the water as it goes over Niagara Falls is quite a remarkable thing. And so that's the thought here, that that all of his senses are being connected to this. And of course, I've had some interesting chats with uh, with Phil over the years uh, about uh, uh, there was an, a guy called Von Daniken uh, who was a, a complete 
crazy individual, but he he wrote a book called Was God an Astronaut? And of course, he was a lot of his thesis was based on Ezekiel and these visions in Ezekiel. And and so you've got this, you know, noise and he's describing this noise and he's kind of saying, oh, it's like a spacecraft, you know, kind of going up from the earth, all this kind of stuff. I, I know Phil's juices are kind of uh, running here as he <laughs> he's reminded of those things. But but it, it really was quite a sensual experience that all of his senses are being peaked by this tremendous sound. The cherubim is uh, wings uh, the, 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 that are emanating from this chariot uh, throne. Notice verse 6 and 7 where we have the implementation of judgment. It says, it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying... Take fire from between the wheels, from between the, the cherubim. Then he went and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubim onto the fire that was between the cherubim and took thereof and put it onto the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And of course, the implication is he went out and flung it down on the city of Jerusalem. That's the picture that is being conveyed to us here. So he returns to the man with the ink on, uh, the man who had had a, a ministry of mercy in chapter 9, uh, marking out those that sighed and cried. And now he has a ministry of judgment in this particular chapter, uh, which is to scatter them over the city. By the way, just to remind ourselves of where that came from, uh, it's from verse 2, where it says, He spoke unto the man clothed with linen, said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, Fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. So basically what he's commanded is now actually being enacted here. So the stage is now set for the fiery destruction of Jerusalem, which here is symbolically represented as coming directly from the Lord himself. Fire that proceeds from him, from his throne, and of course, it will, if it's coming from his throne, it will be absolutely just in its activity. It will harm nothing except that which is evil, right? Because it's very discriminatory. That's why there was a marking of those in chapter 9 uh, that sighed and that cried. Uh, but it, it, it will burn up that which is evil. The wrath of God is a terrible thing. Uh, but it, it, it never oversteps its bounds. It always is based on God's righteous judgment, and it all was restrained by the strictest strictest justice. And so this fire uh, is on those that indeed have shown themselves to be worthy of divine judgment because of their sin and their rebellion. And uh, it is, again, a mark of God's justice and his judgment. So God's judgment of fire scattered on Jerusalem this is the symbolic representation. We said that when you look at um, the text of Scripture, you'll see it being fulfilled. And we saw it in 2 Kings 25. And let me just read it again for us, remind ourselves of how this actually was literally fulfilled. And so it's uh, 2 Kings 25 and verse 8 and 9. And it says, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. And every great man's house burnt he with fire. So what we see here in symbolic picture in chapter 10 God's divine instrument of chastening, the Chaldeans, fulfilled it in 2 Kings 25, verse 8 and 9, when they destroyed the city by fire. And of course, if you remember when we were looking together at Nehemiah, that uh, uh, part of his task was rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the gates. And of course, the, he tells us directly in, in Nehemiah chapter 1 that the gates had been burned with fire. And so what a task he had. It was a it was quite the, the sight, really, uh, uh, to see Jerusalem. And that's why it caused um, our dear friend Nehemiah to weep when he heard of the state of Jerusalem. 
And of course, this is all marks of divine judgment. So from verse 8, really to the end of the chapter, it really is taken up with the departure of the glory of God. We've seen twofold things in the, in the chapter, destruction of the city of God, departure of the glory of God. So it says this, verse 8, there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. You remember we said that these are uh, a lot of parallels with chapter 1 and uh, chapter 1 verse 5. Uh, again, we saw this, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of all living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And so clearly they, uh, in verse 8, it says, they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. And so, again, it's a, it clearly is a, a reiteration of that judgment. We, we get that clearly in verse 22 of chapter 10 it says the likeness of their faces was the same faces which i saw by the river of kibar their appearance and and themselves they went everyone straight forward so he's again he's the vision he saw the banks of the kibar he's seen it again in jerusalem and the hands were mentioned in both places verse 9 he says and when i looked behold the four wheels by the cherubim one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a beryl stone. Uh, so again, we, we're looking at this chariot vision. Now, there's just a kind of a, an interesting thought here too, that the, the word that's used for the wheels here, uh, the appearance uh, of the wheels, it says the four wheels, the word literally in Hebrew means whirling wheels like well, whirling so they're in movement uh, the wheels are named based on their function uh, so they the idea of, of they set god's chariot in motion by revolving uh, there's this movement that sets the chariot going and i want to suggest to you that what what you've got here with the emphasis on the wheels uh, and of course the movement of the wheels is, is the idea that the chariot throne is a, about to be removed and we're seeing all the activity of movement. The wheels are moving. Uh, the wings of the cherubim are, are, are flapping or however you describe that. So there's evidence that God is getting ready to move. That's the picture that's being conveyed to us. That was interesting last night, my last flight was an old propeller jet, you know, one of these jets that has the old propellers. And before we took off, we were on the runway, but the the wheels are beginning of the uh, of the propellers are beginning to to spin, and we were getting ready to make our departure. And so that's the idea of these whirling wheels, named for their function. Uh, they they're preparing the way for their departure. Uh, of the glory of God, which is going to be described in verse 15 through 19. God's, God's glory is about to whirl out of his temple on the whirling wheels. He's about to depart uh, his glory and the, the whirling wheels and the rustling wings. He's moving out. And again, what a tragedy, though. This is this is a great tragedy that the very God of glory who had... Uh, lived in the midst of his people after 400 years of provocation since the dedication of Solomon's temple finally has to leave. And uh, again, it, it really is a very sad, sad moment. It says, as for their appearance, again, speaking of these cherubim, they four had one likeness, or the wheel, sorry, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked. They followed it. They turned not as they went. So whatever direction the head of the cherubim goes, that's the direction the wheels go. Uh, they don't have to turn. Uh, they've got, you know, wheels within a wheel. Uh, you see, you've often seen the, the picture like a gyroscope. It doesn't matter which direction uh, they will follow. And so we want to pay attention to some of the uh, additions, uh, we said, and the omissions from chapter 1. And here's here's one of the uh, additions in verse 12. It says, their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. 
Now, we did learn in chapter one that the wheels were full of eyes, but now the additional piece of information is that the actual cherubim themselves are full of eyes. Uh, can, can you imagine Ezekiel seeing this and trying to describe what he's seeing? I mean, it must have been something quite the sight. I think we just read through these things and we just let it kind of almost blow over us. We don't see. But I, I want to suggest to you that when we get to glory, as of course, our focus is going to be on the Lord of glory. And that's going to be captivating our attention. But if we ever just glimpse around, we're going to be seeing some incredible sights of these heavenly creatures and things that we've we've attempted to even describe. But but I suppose like the words of the Queen of Sheba, we're going to say when we get to glory, the half has not been told us when we see some of these things. It's going to be quite, quite the sight. But what's the, what's the significance of, of all of this? Well, the, the significance is this, that God's throne acts based on his omniscience. All God's judgment will be on the basis of perfect knowledge. Remember that the, the God sees everything that is going on. No possibility of error or misunderstanding can ever be leveled against an omniscient God. And that's the, the that's the focus that, that God as he acts, it's based on what he clearly sees. And of course it's ironic because uh, we saw in chapter eight yeah, and even uh, in chapter nine that these uh, people of Judah, one of their accusations was God doesn't see and God doesn't care. And the very, chariot throne and the cherubim that surround that throne speak to us of the fact that God does see and his justice is based on the fact that he has all the facts and he sees perfectly. Back again in Revelation chapter 4, uh, we see in verse 6, it says, before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of, of, of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind and so that's why we draw the parallel between these uh, beasts of revelation or living creatures of revelation a parallel uh, with what we see here in ezekiel uh, they're the same creatures and again full of eyes so again based on omniscience one day every individual will stand before a holy righteous god who sees and knows all things because we know for the unsaved, it'll be this is your life and they will have their life played back to them and, and God will show his justice in condemning them to an eternity in the lake of fire. And the evidence will be very evident that it's all based on God's omniscience. He saw everything they did, not even what they did, but what they even thought. It's all going to be presented. On the other hand, for the believer, um, God saw all our sin, but he placed it on his son. But we still have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And our service will be evaluated. And again, it won't be based on what men saw, but what he saw. <laughs> and he sees the motives of the heart. He sees all of those things. And our service will be evaluated by the God who sees everything. So it's good to be reminded of that, um, that <clears throat> we don't want to allow unbelief ever to come into our hearts to the point where we're like the men of judah who say well god doesn't see oh yes he does he sees everything and it's good to keep reminding ourselves of that verse 13 says as for the wheels it was cried unto them in my hearing O wheel and the thought here is it's, this is can be taken as a command the wheels were to be set in motion as we've noticed, the wings were evidently in motion, so the chariot is ready to, to move, and that's why we hear this command from the throne. Oh, wheel, it's time to move. We have to, we have to leave this place. And so the command is for the departure of the glory of God. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 14, it says, and everyone had four faces. Now, again, he's describing these cherubim. And this is where we see another uh, difference uh, between what we saw in chapter one 
And we've already alluded to it when we did chapter one, but in case you didn't remember that, um, it says in verse 14, everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second, the face was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. Now, where that differs uh, from chapter one is that the four faces in chapter one, one of them was an ox. And that ox has been replaced by a cherub here in verse 14. And of course, that has led to lots of different uh, explanations that people have set forth uh, to, to explain why the difference. And so I want to go through just a couple of them, just because it's kind of amusing in some ways. Uh, for example, one rabbi, uh, Raish Lakish, uh, suggested that Ezekiel was distressed when he saw the ox because it reminded him of the sin of the golden calf in Exodus 32. And so he prayed for mercy, and as a result, it was changed to the face of a cherub. And so that's that's one of the <clears throat> proposed explanations. It's just kind of interesting to think of these things. The second view is that the face of an ox was, in fact, the normal understanding of the face of a cherub. And it's actually true that in Akkadian literature, which again goes back to the uh, the Chaldeans and their empire and even before them, uh, they, they had a creature called a kuribu, uh, cognate from cherub, and it appears to have non-human faces like looking like an, axe, uh, an ox. Maybe, maybe that's where the word caribou, I never thought about this, but maybe that's where it comes from, this word uh, uh, kuribu, uh, but so some some have suggested that's the that's the thought here. Some our more liberal friends suggest it's just a mistake. Although the manuscript evidence is overwhelming uh, in unison that there is a change between ox in chapter one and um, the cherub here in chapter ten. So I, I don't think a good way of dealing with scripture is to say, oh, this is a mistake. I think that's a, that's a Sadducean interpretive method, <laughs> which I'm not happy with. <laughs> uh, I think we want to believe what the, the word of God is correct in every way. Clearly, they're the same that, that he saw in chapter one, because he says, verse 22, and the likeness of their faces was the same. So clearly he's seeing the same creatures. And again, we, we did suggest a solution um, that both the ox and the cherub are servants. Uh, the ox is a servant on earth, often described as the John D. attractor of the ancient world. You know, that that and so it was a picture of the Christ in the Gospel of Mark serving his people, uh, serving on earth, the, the, the perfect servant. And, of course, the cherub uh, is one of the angelic realms who serve in the heavenly realm. And so, of course, we think of the Lord Jesus now his, as his service ended. Or is it a different type of service? Well, I believe that he still serves, doesn't he? Uh, he is now seated at God's right hand, and he's still serving his people. He's our advocate. He's our high priest. He's our intercessor. <laughs> Uh, if nobody else prayed for you today, I know somebody who did, and that's the Lord Jesus. And so the, 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 the spiritual truth that's being conveyed to us is this, that if these living creatures, which they, they our cherubim, picture for us the, the person of the Lord Jesus and his different aspects, then we can say for certain that his service was not merely earthly service. It's a continued service. So, verse 15, it says, and the cherubim were lifted up. So, again, they're, they're removing themselves uh, from where they are. Remember, he's taken to the very sanctuary of God. They're, they're lifted up. They're getting ready to move. This is the living creatures, he says, uh, the creature that I saw by the river of Kiba. So, leaving us in no doubt, this is exactly the same thing uh, that was... Uh, 
seen before. In fact, just go back to chapter 8, verse 16, where we saw the same idea. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, which were backs were toward the temple of the Lord, their faces toward the east. They worshipped the sun toward the east. And I don't know why I looked at that verse. 1016, I'm sorry. I'm just to put it down to fatigue here 1016 it says when the cherubim went the wheels went by them and when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth the same wheels also turned not from beside them so a complete harmony between the wings and the wheels no discordant note whatsoever about the throne of god acting completely in unison all the parts working together in terms of to fulfill God's ultimate purpose, and that is to depart from the temple. And he says in verse 17, when they stood, they stood, and when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. And then we read this, this very sad verse, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight, when they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So he is witnessing uh, this, he says, in my sight. Still no understanding or even acknowledgement from all the other individuals that have been described in these visions. They're too busy looking uh, elsewhere than to be looking at the glory departing. So we said this departure of the glory signals the end of a relationship that had existed for almost four centuries since the Temple of Solomon had been dedicated. The divine king has abandoned his residence. The east gate was the main entrance of the outmost court and Ichabod is now written over the temple. Now, what's interesting is that after the glory departs, they will still continue to function in the temple for quite some time. But he's not there. They will continue to go through the motions. Um, even though they, they're full of idolatry, they'll still... The priests will still be offering sacrifices. There'll still be all the outward ritual of the, religion, the Jews' religion, but the glory of the God of Israel has gone. And again, we can't help but parallel the church in Laodicea, where, again, the Lord Jesus, the gathering center, is outside the door knocking, saying, please, could you let me in? Anybody here listening here? Anybody hear my voice? He's outside the door. And yet I would suggest that business is continuing as usual. And they don't even know. They're oblivious of the fact that the Lord of glory is no longer in their midst. Filled with activity, filled with religious activity, but the Lord is gone. Of course, uh, some suggest and i think i agree with them that uh, in once the rapture of the church occurs there will be a lot of churches that will continue as normal uh, because um there's no life in them whatsoever yeah. they're, they're just they're just a sham and it'll just be an empty sham but it is a warning to all of us isn't it that um, we, we we need to be conscious that he is in the midst and not lose sight of the Lord of glory. Keep our eyes firmly on him and not you know, kind of get sidetracked into just religious activity for the sake of religious activity and lose the sight of the Lord of glory. And so it says that he's there at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. The glory of the God of Israel was uh, over them above. And then he says in verse 20, he says, this is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar, and I knew that they were the cherubim. Now, again, we said last time, perhaps part of that is that he had been taken in to see the 
cherubim in the temple. And that's why he doesn't just call them living creatures anymore. He knows now because he's seen the depictions of the cherubim all over the, the temple. And he knows that this is exactly what they are. He knew that they were the cherubim. Everyone had four faces apiece, everyone four wings, and the lightness of the hands of a man was under their wings. The lightness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Kiba, their appearance and themselves. They went everyone straight forward. The final word is that every cherub went straight forward, thus proclaiming the impossibility, really, of thwarting or frustrating the plans of God. The glory was departing. The city was about to be destroyed. Their object and mission undeviatingly before them at all times. They're moving forward in God's divine plan. So that leads us nicely uh, into chapter 11. And there's just one more thing that he wants us to see in this Final, you know, he's going to go back at the end of chapter 11 and report these visions to the elders who have come to see him in his house by the banks of the Kibars. This is kind of the final section uh, of this, the visions that he saw from chapter 8 onwards. So this one deals with the judgment on the leaders of God. And we're thinking more of the judges. Um, we've, we've already seen the priests, we've already seen the Sanhedrin, but this would be the judges that sat at the gate that we're going to see now. And so the final aspect is on the judgment of the leaders of God. So if we remind ourselves again, the con uh, 8 through 11, chapters 8 through 11 of Ezekiel uh, deal with the contributory causes of both coming judgment on Judah and Jerusalem, and why the glory of God was abandoning the temple altogether. So that's kind of the big picture. We've got to keep that in our minds as we go through. So in chapter 8, we have witnessed the exposure of sin. He was taken, he saw the idolatry in the house of God. Chapter 9, we saw the judgment on idolaters, uh, the, uh, the slaughter weapon in the hand of the uh, these angels. In chapter 10, we saw the destruction of the city. And in chapter 11, we're going to see the depopulation and the scattering of the city. There's going to be a, quite an emphasis in chapter 11 of the fact that they're going to be scattered. But also what's interesting in chapter 11 is that we get the first glimmer of hope in this whole vision in chapters 8 through 11. First glimmer of hope is that there is a regathering. And of course, it's good to remind ourselves, even the glory departing that we, we witnessed in chapter 10, uh, if we got to Ezekiel 43, we'll see the same glory coming back. So the Ichabod for Jerusalem and for the temple is not a forever Ichabod. Uh, it's not like Shiloh. Shiloh is done with. It's not going to be uh, ever a center of God's purposes again. But Jerusalem will be. And the temple will be, although it'll be a different temple. We're going to see that in Ezekiel. But God will still return and dwell amongst his people in that temple. So that's a glorious thing to look forward to. So, so chapter 11, we get a little glimmer of hope. We're going to see something. We're going, to, we're going to see our first introduction in Ezekiel's writings to the new covenant. And it's kind of going to be exciting because Jeremiah mentions it too. A lot of parallels and uh, great uh, things to consider when we get there, but we'll uh, just to whet our appetites. So depopulation and scattering. And so the people who thought they would remain in safety in the city are going to be brought out of the midst of it. Notice chapter 11, verse 7. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, you are slain whom you have laid in the midst of it. They are the flesh this is city is the cauldron, but I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. So he's going to bring them out of the city. They thought they were safe in the city. They thought that, that it would never be destroyed. That, you know, the temple was there. They're going to be safe. They felt very secure because I'm going to bring you out of that place. And 
<clears throat> he's going to deliver them into the hands of strangers. Verse 9, I'll bring you out of the midst thereof and deliver you to the hands of strangers and will execute judgment among you. Of course, that's the Babylonians going to take some of them into captivity. Some of them are going to fall by the sword. And then in verse 10 and 11, they're going to be judged in the borders of Israel. You shall fall by the sword. I'll judge you in the border of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord. The city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall you be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. So a lot of it is that the fact that they felt very secure in Jerusalem. They felt sure that God would never destroy his city and that they would be safe there. Even though the heat was on because the Babylonians were on the outside, they felt that they were going to be safe. But also we said that in this very chapter, verse 17 through 21, there's evidence of a restoration. And we'll, we'll, we won't read that now, but we will enjoy reading that when we get there. So that there's, a, there's a lot of irony in the chapter in connection with the structure. The first half of the chapter, the leading citizens will be dragged out of the city for judgment and destruction. The second half, the exiles who were previously being dragged out of the city <laughs> will conversely be gathered for restoration. And of course, part of it is the ones that were still in Jerusalem, they felt like they were the choice cuts of meat, that they were they were left behind because they were the best. And God had taken all the riffraff out uh, for judgment in, in captivity, but they were going to be safe and they were they were the, the choice cuts, so to speak. And so God is going to show, I'm going to drag you guys out. And those that you think are, are the awful, that you think are the terrible bits, they're going to come back and they're going to be restored. So it's kind of a an irony in the layout of the chapter. So we're going to look at the results of God's judgment in verses 1 through 13. And so we'll begin with the cause of coming judgment in verses 1 through 3. And so it says this, Moreover, this is verse 1, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me onto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes, of the people. So these are princes of the people. They're in a leadership role. Now, 25 men. Lots of discussion on are they the same 25 men that we saw in chapter 8 uh, that were involved in gross idolatry. And um, there's a lot of debate about this, and particularly because of Jazaniah because there is a Jazaniah mentioned in chapter 8. And um, the the difficulty is that the Jazaniah that's mentioned in chapter 8 has a different father to the Jazaniah that is mentioned in chapter 11. And so that has caused some consternation. Are they the same man? How does that all work out? And so there's a lot of discussion and debate concerning this. Let's just think about the name Jazaniah again, because uh, we, we did give a, a, a description of the meaning of the name, but it means the Lord hears. And uh, if uh, <clears throat> uh, he has a different father, as we said, uh, the, the, the first one, he was in chapter eight, was the son of Shaphan. And so if you look at uh, chapter eight, verse 11, uh, there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense upon it. In that case, there are 70 men. In this case, there are 25, although there's another 25 mentioned in a different context here. So my suggestion is that there are, a different group of individuals to the 25 that are mentioned in chapter 8. Um, another one that's mentioned is Pelatiah. Um, he's another one of the leaders. And I want to suggest that these uh, these people, wh where do we find them? Uh, they're at the east gate. And I want to suggest to you the gates of the city were where administration took place. That was where legal matters 
It was kind of like the city's courthouse. Uh, we know that from the book of Ruth, uh, when uh, there was this desire to formalize matters, uh, that, that there was a, a need to go to the gate to get things dealt with. And so Lot, uh, he was in the gate of Sodom. He became part of the city's administration where justice took place. So it's kind of like the city's courthouse. So <clears throat> perhaps it's better to see it as two different groups. It's not unusual to have uh, people with the same name. Uh, for instance, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of Zechariahs in our Bible. And uh, so it's not unusual to have people with the same name. So see, because they've got different fathers, it's probably right to see them as two different individuals. But <clears throat> the principles among these reprobate leaders have names reminding them. So the, the kind of the key leaders, because he, he's given us two of the leaders here, this, uh, this man, Jazanir, and then this man, Pelatiah. Their names show that at some point their parents had faith. Uh, Jehovah hears, hears uh, is Jazanir. Pelatiah, Jehovah delivers. Uh, great names. Jehovah hears, Jehovah delivers. And so in both cases, the parents were expressing belief, but sadly, it would seem that these people did not live up to their names. In fact, what they're known for is wicked counsel. Uh, because if you notice in verse 2, it says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in the city. And so even though they've got names that would express at least parental faith, uh, it would seem to us that these people did not live up to that. And of course, we know that, um, uh, I'm just thinking of this recently, there's a lot of children that are given names that express the aspirations and hopes of their parents, that they would turn out to be uh, like these individuals they've been named after, that they would have something of that character. And uh, sadly, giving someone a name doesn't necessarily relate to their character. Now, quite often in the scriptures, people live up to their names, but sometimes clearly they don't. And of course, we would desire that. And of course, the last chapter is not written. On, on many a prodigal that has a name, uh, but they're not living it. And uh, we, our prayer is that they would have not only the name, but they would live up to that name. But what we could say is faith and godliness are not matters of natural heritage. Um, each individual has to respond personally to God's working in their lives. So they're leaders of the people, but they weren't providing wise counsel. Their message was indeed a scornful rejection of God. They devise mischief. They give wicked counsel in the city. So what is it? What counsel are they giving that is uh, causing the ire of God upon them? Which say, it is not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron. We be the flesh. They're telling the people the city is safe encouraging them to build houses. Uh, don't worry, we're doing fine here. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, so they were, they were confident that they would be safe in Jerusalem, despite what prophets such as Jeremiah and Ezekiel had said to them, they still feel that they're safe in the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, also they, they talk about this cauldron, the city is the cauldron, we be the flesh. And so the innuendo is, is, is this, this metaphor is that the people in Jerusalem were really the choice cuts of meat, while the exiles in Babylon were just the scraps and rejected pieces, the offal thrown on the dung heap of Babylon. The city is the cauldron, we're the flesh. Uh, so although there's heat from the fire, upon them in the form of the Chaldeans uh, surrounding the city and all the rest of it, they felt the defensive city walls that they, as the flesh in the cauldron, will be protected. The city's defenses would be impregnable. The defenders would be safe from the fires of war as meat in the cauldron protects it from the flames. And so the flesh may feel some discomfort uh, from the heat transmitted through the cauldron, 
but it will only be a temporary distress and the end will be they will be secure so let's build let's get let's build houses and so that's kind of the the context of this judgment so this is the cause of judgment this wicked counsel from verse 4 to 12 we have the course of coming judgment where it's coming from god describing it therefore he says prophesy against them prophesy O son of man so even though he's in spirit taken, he, he's got to prophesy to them. What is the message that he is to give? And, and how is this message coming to him? Notice verse 5. This is a one of the clearest uh, kind of uh, affirmations of divine inspiration in the book of Ezekiel. It says, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, even every one of them. And so Ezekiel would fit nicely into Peter's description in 2 Peter 1 verse 21, where he says, Prophecy came not of all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, as they were born along, carried along by the Holy Ghost. Well, this is what Ezekiel is doing here a very explicit statement of divine inspiration the wicked men have spoken in verse 3 which say he says it's it's not near let us build and all the rest of it and now a holy man of god is speaking as he's moved by the spirit of god the lord is speaking through his servant in opposition to these men who have speaking spoken and so God not only knew the actions, but also the thinking of the leaders and people in Jerusalem. And again, isn't this a quite a statement? I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. We talked about God's omniscience. It's a frightful thing, isn't it, to be reminded that God knows everything that even comes into our minds. I often think about that in terms of the gospel, that if we really had a this is your life, you know, the, the great white throne judgment, and we were to broadcast any individual in the audience to broadcast their life, that would be embarrassing enough. But what if God was to broadcast their thought life as well as their real life? I would suspect it would be very uncomfortable. In fact, if anybody could, they would want to press an erase button and erase that bit from anybody else seeing it. And that's the beauty, isn't it, of the gospel of the grace of God, that we, in a sense, have pressed the erase button. And in this new covenant we're going to learn about in the end of this chapter, the Lord is going to tell us uh, great truth of the new covenant, our sins and iniquities, I will remember them no more. Not only the sins we did, but the very sins we thought about doing. Oh, what a wonderful message this is, that we have the gospel of the grace of God. But nevertheless, for these people, what a frightful thing to hear from God that he says, I know not only the things you're doing, but the things that come into your mind, every one of them. And that's a good place for us to end this morning.